morning, everybody. It's 7 o'clock. Thank you for watching us from Whistler to Wigan. Really, a lunch date you won't want to miss. Boris Johnson and Sir Keir Starmer face to face at Prime Minister's questions with strong views over the Jimmy Savile slur from both sides of the house, including apparently the Speaker's chair. We'll bring it to you live at noon. And in a few minutes, we're joined by the Health Minister Edward Argo. We'll get his thoughts too on the NHS backlog. We'll also speak to Labour's Pack Fadden and the Mayor of London, Siddi Khan. How will we fit it all in? It's Wednesday, the 9th of February. Head to head, the Prime Minister prepares to face the Labour leader this lunchtime after a warning from the Speaker that words have consequences in the wake of the Savile slur. Ships in the night, Russia claims warships heading to the Black Sea are on a drill. We'll ask the Ukrainian ambassador if he believes that. He's one of our better players. West Ham's manager defends his decision to use Kurt Zuma, who booted his cat around his kitchen as fans show their anger. Wagatha Christie, we reveal the astonishing accusations from the footballers' wives locked in a court battle. Is today the day that Team GB gets off the mark in the Winter Games? Charlotte Banks is on her snowboard this hour, racing for a medal. Adele wins big at the Brits with three awards, but it's Dave who set the audience alight, winning the prize for best hip-hop and grime. Also on the programme for you this morning, Scent from the Wild will take you through some of the wildlife photographs of the year and speak to a winning photographer. Feel the rhythm. Feel the rhyme. Get on up. It's bustling time. And the new Cool Runnings are going to be joined a little later by the Jamaican bobsleigh team. Uh, hoping to sp uh, sprint legend uh, Usain Bolt can inspire them to victory in Beijing. I'm going to have another go at that in the next hour. I was slightly distracted because the minister is uh, here. Good morning. Good morning Thanks Kat. for joining us this morning. Thanks for coming in. Uh, let's talk waiting list to, sh to start with, should we? Um, they are going to perhaps double over the, the next two years until March of 2024. Your manifesto said that you were going to be there when patients needed you now. What happened? Um, the pandemic happened is the short answer, Kay. We knew that we had a challenge with waiting lists before. The pandemic, that's why our manifesto commitment was clear. But we've had two years of huge disruption to our NHS as it both tackled the pandemic, but also as it wasn't able to do as many routine or normal procedures as it normally would. And that figure you talked about, about the waiting list um, going up, there's about, well, there's just around six million people on the waiting list. There's around eight and a half million who we would normally expect to have come forward over the past few years who haven't. And therefore, we've got to make an assessment that many of them will now start coming forward. So we should expect to see, as the Secretary of State says, so that list going up before we can bring it down. But we've set out the plan to do that um, this week. One in 10 people presently on an NHS waiting list right now. It's actually, it's around one in nine people on the, on the waiting list. I'm always straight with you and your mm. viewers, Kay, about this. I think it's one in five in Wales. That's a huge figure. And every one of those people will understandably be concerned they'll either be in pain or they'll be and be anxious about wanting to find out. About 75% of those in the, on the waiting list are not on the waiting list for actual treatment. They're on it for things like diagnostic tests in the large part. And they will be people who don't know um, what their situation is. So understandably, they'll be very anxious. That's why we're investing heavily in diagnostics, because people want to know whether they're OK or whether they do need to have treatment. And people can move around the country to have treatment. Uh, that has been the case for some time, but people haven't been doing that, obviously, because of the pandemic, mm. but even before that, they weren't. So how do they find out how to do that? Well, there's a number of, of uh, ways we're doing that. First one, and I think um, my boss, the Secretary of State, I think was on with you earlier he was. this week. My planned care is one of those uh, one of those mechanisms online, people being able to see waiting times at different hospitals. So you just log on to the um, NHS? You'll be able to, we're developing that, uh, that system as we speak. He so it's to not be open. available yet? It's not there yet. He wanted to be open with people. That's a key part of the plan. But equally as part of that plan, we're working with the NHS with a national coordination team who will work with clinicians who will be able to give people more information and options where they may want to stay local, but there may be a longer wait for that particular so speciality in their hospital. It? but they may be able to go 
around the country. The NHS is putting in place that plan to help move people around with things like transport. But it's not but there also, yet. No, it's not there. The Secretary so of State set out be? the plan yeah. for this, and that will come on stream later this year. Mm. It's a part of that plan. We've already started, though. I know there was a lot of speculation on Monday saying, well, where is the plan? Does this mean that we're delaying helping people? No, it doesn't, because we've already announced, for example, the diagnostic centres, diagnostic hubs, which are already up and running in, I think, 60 or 70 different places. So we haven't waited, but this plan sets out that longer-term approach and, crucially, some of those targets and those trajectories for trying to bring that waiting list mm. back down. Uh March 2024 is when we can see the waiting list start to fall. That's perilously close for a government, given that the election is in May of that year. Well, I think, Kay, what's important with this plan, and you'll see, it, you'll see it in some of the comments, I think, from some of the NHS leaders who've commented on it, is, yes, it's ambitious. It wants to bring those waiting lists down because every person on that uh, waiting list, every statistic on that waiting list is a real person with health concerns. But we've got to be realistic about this and we've got to be honest with people about the scale of that challenge um, and, uh, and the impact that will have both on workload and on workforce. So what we've set is, is what we think is ambitious but realistic as a way to bring that waiting list down and we want to be straight with people about that. OK, your ultimate boss, uh, Prime Minister's questions later on today. Is he going to apologise for what he said about uh, Keir Starmer? Well, it's, the Prime time. it's now time. The Prime Minister, Kay, has been... Um, very clearly, he's clarified what he was talking about. I know colleagues of mine have been on, had this conversation with you in recent days. He's clarified that he was talking about Sir Keir in the context of his leadership role at the C, uh, CPS, um, just as, quite rightly, Sir Keir holds him to account for his leadership role over the government. That doesn't mean personal responsibility for individual decisions, but that's the context. And the Prime Minister has clarified that. Okay, and well, I don't suspect, take it from And me. I'll be honest with you, I suspect yeah. that's, that's what you will hear from the Prime Minister uh, later. Yeah, don't take it from me, take it from the Speaker. This is what he said yesterday. These sorts of comments only inflame opinions and generate disregard for the House, and it is not acceptable. Our words have consequences, and we should always be mindful of that fact. And he specifically slurred the Leader of the Opposition, didn't he? Well, you heard Sir Lindsay there, the speaker, about words having consequences. They do, and I think all politicians, all of us in the public eye, whether in media and politics and a whole range of um, sorts of indeed individuals on things like Twitter, um, need to think carefully about the words we use. I have no doubt that after I come off this morning media round, I will go back to my inbox and I will receive threats and abuse. That's sadly what so happens. It shouldn't happen. Then, I think everyone you? needs to reflect carefully yeah, on the language they use. Yeah, but those people, that, those trolls are not... The Prime Minister no, I think country, everyone speaking needs, from the dispatch I think box. everyone needs to reflect carefully on the language slurred. they use. He specifically slurred. He specifically slurred. And he's, well, the Prime Minister's clarified. Didn't he, though? You acknowledged that. The Prime that. Minister has clarified... Let me just play for you what he said. Here we go. This leader of the opposition, a former director of public prosecutions, Mr Speaker, he, he spent most of his time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile. He, he, he was talking about him, not the position that he holds, but the... the Prime Minister's been clear. That, and they clarified that, I think, on a few days afterwards, that he was referring to him, and he said he, in the context of his role as leader of an organisation, not Obviously as an individual. Obviously not, from what we just heard. That's what the Prime Minister has been clear about when him. he clarified by that. And you believe the Prime Minister? You, you, think Prime Minister. you think that's... Let's I just the Prime Minister. OK, let's just, um, let's just remind our viewers um, exactly what he said uh, in Blackpool when he was clarifying the situation. I'm talking not about uh, the leader of the opposition's personal... Um, record when he was, uh, when he was DPP, uh, and, and, I, and I totally understand that he had nothing to do uh, personally with those decisions. He was talking about the Leader of the Opposition, I just played you the He said, when, in the context of his leadership of the DPP, and that mm. he had nothing personally to do with those decisions. He was clear about that, it wasn't a personal point he was making, as the Prime Minister made clear. And as and Keir quite rightly had said, he, when he was DPP, he okay. took responsibility for the successes and the failures. He was totally right about that, just as he's right to say the Prime Minister as leader of the government, takes responsibility for all aspects of what happens in government. Someone who was by the Prime Minister's side for 12 years resigned as a direct result of what the Prime Minister did and did not apologise. Talking about Manira Mirza, of course, she wrote in her letter, there was no fair or reasonable basis for the assertion. This was not the normal cut and thrust of politics. It was an inappropriate and partisan reference to a horrendous case of child sex abuse. She decided to resign over it. Well, I've worked with Munira in the past when she was at City Hall um, in her previous role, and I have great respect for Munira. I'm very sorry to see her go. I think she's a lady of great integrity and great ability. I'm sorry to see her go. But as I say, I saw the Prime Minister's clarification there. He was clear that he was referring to 
uh, as Sakir in the context of leader of an organisation, not personally. I accept that clarification, but I would come back to the point I made to you, which is, of course, we do all need to be uh, mindful of the language we use, as I always seek to be when I come on your show and yeah. I speak at the dispatch. Uh, which we appreciate, of course, but Julian Smith, Tobias Elwood, Robert Lug and Sadiq Khan, who's on later on, Nicholas Sturgeon, uh, David Lammy, Ed Davey, uh, the wife of... Uh, the husband, forgive me, of uh, Joe Cox, who, who was murdered, all saying that words have consequences. The Prime Minister, why is it so hard for him to apologise? Well, I think you're right to say words have consequences, and I think that's why it was right the Prime Minister clarified what he meant and was very clear in that clarification. I think it was clear that he was not suggesting any personal involvement by Keir. I think it's important that he made that clarification. I'm pleased that he did make that clarification, but I think he was right to make it. So, why is... Sorry, such a difficult word for this Prime Minister. Well, I think this Prime Minister has set out his, his position very clearly. He's clarified it. He's explained what he meant um, with those remarks. He meant, explained very clearly it wasn't a personal reference. And I think that... Um, that that is an appropriate way for him to have, have moved things forward. Mm. Uh, let's talk very briefly about this mini shuffle, reshuffle. Yeah. We disappointed you weren't bumped up. Okay, I. Is Sajid Javid's job? Okay, I've been um, Minister of State for Health. I think I'm the longest serving Minister of State for Health in 20 years, I think now. Time for a, time um, for a bump up. And I, I suspect if I was in another role, I wouldn't get the opportunity so frequently to come on your, hey. on your program <laughs> and do the morning round. Now, I, look, it's, it's a huge privilege for me to be Minister of State for Health, particularly during a pandemic, I've had the opportunity, in very difficult times, and you and I have spoken on many occasions, but to work with some amazing um, people. I, like everyone else, serve wherever I'm asked to and do my best for my country in that context. And it's been a huge privilege and continues to be a huge privilege to work with the NHS and drive forward mm -hmm. our plans for the recovery of waiting lists and support to our NHS. Have you set your wedding date yet? <laughs> um, uh, we might well have done, uh, Kay. Have, have, you told, have you told her, obviously, don't break it to the rest of the world before you've told your fiancé? We, we might well have done, later this year. Oh, lovely. OK, I'll wait for me invite. Thanks it's lovely to Kay. see you. Thank nice you very you. much indeed for joining us. Thank you. A uh, quick look at the front pages of the papers this morning. Telegraph to start with. Uh, quotes the Health Secretary Sajid Javid warning that NHS waiting lists won't begin to get shorter until at least... 2024. The Times says some Conservative MPs believe the Prime Minister plans to clear the NHS backlog uh, aren't ambitious enough. And the Mail also suggesting the government could move faster given that £12 billion is expected to be generated by the national insurance hike in April. The Express also leading on this story, highlighting how 10 million patients have yet to be treated for other conditions due to difficulties brought on by COVID. According to the Eye, a million more children look set to go hungry as the cost of living crisis continues. The mirror carries the words of BP's chief financial officer, who insists that the company has more money than it knows what to do with. And The Guardian reports on a group of Conservative MPs who are accused of trying to derail the government's green agenda. And The Metro has the latest on the court case involving footballers' wives Rebecca Vardy and Colleen Rooney. A reminder that tomorrow at 9am, joined in the studio by the Education Secretary Nadeem Zahawi, who will be answering your questions. You can tweet questions if you would like to. There you go. Ask the Education Secretary at sky.uk. Six Russian warships are sailing to the Black Sea for naval drills, according to the Interfax news agency, citing Russia's defence ministry. Three of the ships have passed through Turkey's straits. Reuters news agency reports the other three are expected to pass today, citing Turkish sources. Russia has massed more than 100,000 troops near its border with Ukraine. It denies any plans to invade. At 9.20, speaking to the uh, Ukrainian ambassador to the UK. Still to come on the programme for you, a frozen lake in Italy. We'll speak to the People's Choice Award winner in the Wildlife Photography of the Year competition. Have changes to the highway code improved conditions for cyclists or made them worse? And the Mayor of London is pledging access to a mentor for all young people who need it. He'll be joining us in the studio. Yesterday, we brought you the news that a West Ham player had apologised after video emerged of him kicking and slapping his pet cat. It's now emerged that Kurt Zuma faces a possible police inquiry into the footage. Well, last night, Kurt Zuma was selected and played for his club, West Ham. 
against Watford and fans made their thoughts very clear singing RSPCA and when the player was fouled chanting that he knew how his cat felt. Well, this is uh, what some of the papers are saying. How could they pick him is the headline on the back page of the Daily Mail this morning. It says West Ham have been criticised for selecting the player for last night's game. The Times it says West Ham's climb into the top four was tainted by the decision to play Kurt Zuma. And the Telegraph says Kurt Zuma was booed by both sets of fans last night. Milena uh, is standing by for us in the newsroom. Hi, Milena. Good morning. What happens now? Hi, Kay. Well, you do have to wonder if West Ham could have just let Kurt Zuma sit this game out, considering the widespread outrage over his actions. He played just 24 hours after this video emerged of him dropping and kicking his pet cat. Um, and when he was asked uh, before the game uh, about whether uh, Kurt Zuma's actions played any you know, influence on his decision to include him in the match, David Moyes, the boss of the club, said that while he was an animal lover, no, because he was one of their better players. Uh, take a listen to what he had to say. I'm really disappointed and uh, the club have taken all the actions that they, they can do at the moment and they're, they're you know, working on that behind the scenes. My job is to try and pick a team and pick the best team, which gives me the best chance at West Ham and uh, Kurt was part of that team. Now, the club did uh, condemn his actions and said that they will deal with it internally, but the decision to include Zuma was widely condemned. One of those was Wild Rev presenter Chris Packham, who said that tonight some humans decided it was more important to allow a man who kicks defenseless fragile animals the opportunity to kick a ball for entertainment. Zuma did issue an apology for his actions, saying there was an isolated incident. So did his brother, who filmed the entire thing. But we do know now that Essex police are conducting, as they say, urgent inquiries and they're also uh, liaising with the RSPCA about it. RSPCA is saying they received dozens of complaints about this over social media. OK, thank you. Thanks a lot, Melona. Uh, there was a happier outcome last night for a cat who held up play at Hillsborough. What's going on there? Poor cat. Yeah, running after a cat, that's never going to end well, is it? Uh, the match between Sheffield Wednesday and Wigan was halted temporarily after the cat wandered onto the pitch. It was left to the Wigan player, Jason Kerr, to scoop it up. And finally, yay, can I have a stroke? Yeah, there we go. He doesn't know what to do. <laughs> there we go. Escort it off the field of play. He's got his claws out and everything. We've got some really big cats to come uh, very shortly on the programme for you. Now, if you thought the incredible Wagatha Christie saga was put to bed in 2019, you were very wrong. This, of course, was that clash between Rebecca Vardy and Colleen Rooney, after Rooney accused the former of leaking private information about Rebecca, who denies the allegations. Yesterday, the High Court witnessed some explosive and explicit messages sent from Rebecca Vardy to her agent, Caroline Watt, about Wayne and Colleen. And Mrs Watt has been put under the spotlight herself after admitting to leaking information to the press about Colleen. But when asked for further evidence, Ms Watt said that, regrettably, <laughs> she dropped her phone in the North Sea. <laughs> <laughs> OK, straight face again, everybody. US officials have arrested a rapper and her partner in connection with the seizure of $3.6 billion worth of Bitcoin. Heather Morgan, who goes by the name of Razzle Khan, and her husband, Ilya Lichtenstein, are accused of attempting to launder 119,754 bitcoins after a hacker attacked the Bitfinex cryptocurrency exchange in 2016. The funds were worth $71 million at the time, but are now worth more than $4.5 billion. And a fire has broken out at an apartment complex under construction in Oklahoma City. It's been described as extremely large and involving rubberized roofing material. But that does not go out well with water, is what apparently the fire service have said. No injuries have currently been reported, thankfully. 
Canada's most important border crossing with the United States has been blocked by truckers protesting about COVID rules. The bridge between Detroit and Windsor, Ontario, carries a quarter of all trade between the two countries. The protests began in Ottawa and have been causing disruption for 12 days. Well, yet to win a medal in Beijing, Team GB hoping to change that today as Charlotte Banks goes for gold in the snowboard cross. The uh, current world champion set the second fastest time in qualifying and she is now through to the quarterfinals, which is fantastic. Our sports correspondent Tom Parmenter is at the Snow Centre in Hemel Hempstead for us this morning. Um, hi Tom, tell us more about what we might be hoping for. Well, the Beijing Games hasn't yet delivered a medal for Team GB, but today we're hoping, thinking that it could just be the day because it is all about the snowboard cross. And this is the slope in Hemel Hempstead, which is Charlotte Banks' home course. And coming down here in the pink hat is Amy Fuller. Good morning. Good morning, Amy. How are you doing? You were, of course, at Sochi in the Winter Games, but all eyes are on Charlotte. Is she going to do something today that delivers a medal for Team GB? My fingers and my toes are crossed. She's definitely got the potential. She's had an amazing run up to this Olympic Games. Eight podiums, four of them gold. It is hers to lose. Now, she hasn't always represented Team GB because no. she moved to France when she was four. She was born here in Hemel Hempstead, but represented France at previous Winter Games and has now switched because she felt that Team GB just was a, a better place for her. Yeah, I think the amount of mo money that's been injected through UK Sport and the National Lottery, it's a really good time for snow sports. Throughout the last Games, we've seen huge success. 2014, Jenny Jones bronze medal, and then again Billy Morgan in 2018. So snow sports in a really good place. And Charlotte's got the experience. 2014, she was young, inexperienced. We look at 2018, and this is where border cross is really, really interesting. Quite literally, anything can happen. Unfortunately, she fell over there. So now it's got to be her time. Some people draw the comparison with BMX in the Summer Games because it's a fast-paced race where literally anything can go wrong at any moment. Yeah, I think the success of Kai White and Bethany Shriver in the summer, if you are to take a BMX track, stick it at altitude, cover it in snow, you've got a series of moguls, bank turns, and it is the fastest man or woman to the bottom. So in terms of it being a spectator sport, if you like that, make sure you put it on right now because you're going to be on the edge of your seat. And we know that she's through to the semi-finals and the quarter, the, and the actual final itself will happen at around quarter to eight this morning. Everything yeah. crossed, as you say. Is she going to do it? I think she is, you know. I spoke to her two weeks ago. I got a little intel on her Olympic routine. So a lot of snowboarders got the mountain, they get pumped up, you know, it really revved up. But Charlotte's got a totally different approach. She's very zen in between her runs. So right now you can imagine her. She's at the top of the course and she's quite literally chilling, reading a book, drinking green tea. I say that's the way. Amy, thanks for joining us live on Sky News Breakfast this morning. It's OK, it's about the green tea, reading a book between the races, but all eyes on Charlotte Banks. A lot of people here willing her towards the podium at course to eight. OK, lovely. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Of course, we'll bring that to you live here on Sky News. It's only uh, um, mid-February, and that is already the best entrance by a guest, by a country mile this year. Let's take a look at some of the best pictures making the morning papers for you. The Guardian has this great image of the Heroes Parade for Senegal's football squad, who are celebrating Africa Cup of Nations glory. How cool is that picture? The Forgotten Man, the Telegraph, shows us the moment Lithuania's Prime Minister missed the door to Downing Street and Boris Johnson had to come out to fetch a no here, here. Or maybe she thinks, maybe she thinks the leader lives at number 11. See what I did there? And the Daily Mail has this shot of the Olympic ski jump in Beijing that looks like it's in a dystopian hellscape as it's built in the middle of a repurposed Steel mill, can you believe it? And the Times has this show of stars making a fleeting appearance during a moment of clear sky taken from the top of the cobbler in Argyle and Butte. Gorgeous. Hello again, everybody. Our top stories for you this morning. The Health Minister, Edward Arger, has told this programme that everyone needs to think more carefully about their words. But he says Boris Johnson won't apologise for his Jimmy Savile comments at PMQs today. 
Six Russian warships sailing to the Black Sea for naval drills as Moscow continues to flex its military might on Ukraine's border. And West Ham's manager has defended his decision to play Kurt Zuma, who booted his cat around his kitchen as fans show their anger. Well, it's set to be another high octane Prime Minister's questions today, but the Health Minister Edward Arger told me a few minutes ago that there won't be an apology from Boris Johnson in the Commons. He said the PM had already clarified his comments about Jimmy Savile, but it was time for everyone to take care over their words. All politicians, all of us in the public eye, whether in media and politics and a whole range of um, sorts of indeed individuals on things like Twitter, um, need to think carefully about the words we use. I have no doubt that after I come off this morning media round, I will go back to my inbox and I will receive threats and abuse. That's sadly what so happens. It shouldn't happen. Then, I think everyone needs to reflect carefully. Now, is he going to apologise for what he said about uh, Keir Starmer? Well, it's, the Prime time. it's now time. The Prime Minister Kay has been um, very clear. He's clarified what he was talking about. I know colleagues of mine have been on, had this conversation with you in recent days. He's clarified that he was talking about Sir Keir, in the context of his leadership role at the C, uh, CPS, um, just as, quite rightly, Sir Keir holds him to account for his leadership role over the government. That doesn't mean personal responsibility for individual decisions, but that's the context. And the Prime Minister has clarified that. Okay, and, well, I suspect, don't take it from and I'll be honest with you, I suspect yeah. that's, that's what you will hear from the Prime Minister. Uh... Well, joining us now, former Pensions Minister Baroness Altman. Hello to you. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. Lots to talk to you okay, about, but I wonder if we could just start with that. Should the Prime Minister apologise at the dispatch box, given that's where he um, first came up with the slayer? My own view is absolutely he should. Absolutely he should. Um, and I remember during my time as Minister that uh, I was hauled over the coals for apologising for something I said, which I felt was uh, perhaps a, a little bit uh, misleading or, or, you know, said something that wasn't quite right. Uh, and I was told ministers don't apologise. And I still do not understand why, if one has said something that has been maybe taken the wrong way or caused offence, even if you didn't mean to do that, you can't just say sorry. Uh, you know, it's what we teach our children in the sake of for the sake of family harmony, even if you don't really think what you said was wrong. When you get to the point where everything is all stoked up, you just need to say, I'm sorry for the sake of family harmony. And we've got a country here that, that is really clearly there are some uh, angers that people are boiling over. There's there's, you know, a, a, a real feeling of tension across the country and if an apology can calm things down why would you not do that as a leader of the country why do you think he won't i i must admit that i find it really truly puzzling because uh, i don't think that he meant uh, to cause the kind of hatred and vitriol that has been apparently stoked up by this uh, and I do understand, actually, that uh, Sir Keir Starmer was the leader of, of the CPS at the time, uh, but we all know he was not personally involved in, in the decision. Uh, and Sir Keir Starmer at the time apologised and took responsibility uh, for being the leader of uh, an office where mistakes were made. I think that's usually what one would expect somebody at the top to do if they believe that people uh, have felt, if you like, let down or done something that, that would be helped by an apology. Totally understand. Uh, I wonder if I have... I trouble you for a couple of thoughts on pensions. First of all, MPs uh, voting through a pension rise that will be outstripped by inflation yesterday and the Chancellor's removed the triple lock. Thoughts on that? Well, I was leading a rebellion in the House of Lords and we put a very reasonable compromise to the government that would allow the keeping of the earnings link in the triple lock. It's the earnings protection that has been abandoned. Uh, and has caused so much problem. And unfortunately, MPs in the Commons voted against that. 
it would have given a, a much fairer increase to both the state pension and what's called the pension credit, which is the top up that the poorest pensioners live on, which has always been increased in line with earnings. And suddenly, because earnings rose very fast during the pandemic, uh, the, the link was dropped. I think that was a terrible decision. Uh, I would love to see the government go back on its uh, decision, but I don't think there's any chance of that. And practically, it's probably too late to change the systems. But pensioners are going to struggle. The poorest pensioners in particular uh, have been shortchanged. They were promised the protection that has been taken away. And, and I just don't agree with that policy, I'm afraid. And I also wondered if you had a thought on suggestions from Labour that a windfall tax would be the right way forward for some of these oil companies in order to try to bring down um, energy bills for those that need it most. The uh, flip side to that is the government is saying that a lot of pension funds um, are invest in things like BP, Shell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it could impact on pensioners in that direction. Do you think that's a reasonable argument? Well, uh, I think one can go a little bit too far on the issue of um, worrying about whether or not you should impose taxation policy because of what's happening in pension funds. But I do think that uh, one has to be careful not to take away the ability of our biggest energy companies to invest in clean energy. I, I think that the move to net zero is right. I hope the government does not row back on that. And I don't see signs yet that the government is doing that, although there is some pressure trying to uh, encourage that. And there are a lot of companies that have done extraordinarily well out of both the pandemic and the central bank policies of creating new money, which has uh, inflated asset prices and, and uh, shares and property. So, you know, there is a case for saying that if you need to raise large sums in taxation, one should look to raise that from a broader base, uh, which has benefited rather than uh, the national insurance increase, which I fundamentally disagree with, which places uh, an extra burden on the lower earners whose pay packets will be uh, falling uh, this April at the same time as the cost of living is soaring. So, yes, I think there is a case for broadening the base from which one takes uh, extra taxation. Clearly, we need extra public money to invest and um, shore up both the health service and particularly social care, which is still being left out. Um, but whether or not you should single out the oil companies who we need, I mean, we, we can see geopolitically, Russia is threatening to cut off gas to the West potentially. Yeah. Uh, and there is a real problem because of our dependence on uh, forms of energy that are not necessarily controlled in this country. And we need to invest in environmentally friendly energy sources. The best people to do that are probably uh, some of the bigger energy companies. Okay. So you know, I, don't, I just don't think we should single out one sector in particular. OK. Baroness Altman, uh, fascinating. Thank you so much for taking the time Thanks, to join Gay. us. Lovely morning. to see Thank you. you. And you too. Thank you. Tamara's um, here talking about the um, health minister saying words have consequences. Interesting. Yes, and Ros Altman, a Conservative peer, said there's no doubt the Prime Minister should apologise. You got the sense from Ed Arger, the Health Minister, that he felt a bit uneasy about it. He wasn't defending the Prime Minister. He conceded words have consequences and said it was appropriate for the Prime Minister to have clarified, that's the word that Tory MPs are using about this whole debacle, that he didn't mean Sir Keir Starmer personally when he accused him of not prosecuting Jimmy Savile. He was talking about the organisation that he led. Why does this whole row matter? 
week on from when the Prime Minister made those comments because it has seen uh, resignations from his backroom team. It has seen Tory MPs who are weighing up whether the Prime Minister is the man to lead them into the next election, wondering about his character and judgment. He changed some of his team yesterday, brought in a few new people around him to try and shore up party discipline. But if this is the tone he's going to take, a lot of Tory MPs don't feel very confident in it. I thought it was interesting, Kay, that yesterday Mark Harper, an influential Tory, described um, this whole Savile issue as grim and not the kind of country we want to be. As Tory MPs head off for a week's holiday mm -hmm. tomorrow, I think that will be on their minds. OK, thank you. Thanks a lot, Tamara. Tomorrow's take at nine o'clock, of course. Um, if you were waiting to hear what was happening as far well, uh, as our hopes of um, a gold medal um, in Beijing, our concern, Great Britain's hopes of winning that third gold medal on snow were dashed. Uh, there she is, Charlotte Banks, originally uh, living in France, uh, now returning to the UK to take part. Four Team GB eliminated at the quarterfinal stage of the women's snowboard cross in Beijing. 26-year-old um, recovered from a slow start to lead for much of the race, but apparently pushed wide on a bend, allowing um, the... Oh, she the Australian? ..to move in and literally... Sadly, she is out. Now, last year, an international tribunal found that China had committed genocide against the Uyghur Muslims, an ethnic group native to the country's Xinjiang province. Now, witnesses have told Sky News of being held in so-called black sites abroad, the existence of which is officially denied, of course. Here's Tom Cheshire. Jump! The United Arab Emirates has been rolling out the red carpet for China over recent years. Beneath the friendly diplomacy, though, is a shadowy world, one where Chinese security services operate on UAE soil, a Sky News investigation can reveal, hunting their targets. Wu Huan was detained in Dubai last year after she travelled to help a boyfriend who is also being held. He was a teenager when he voiced his support for the Hong Kong protesters. She says she was kept in a black site operated by China. And Wu says she was even interrogated by high-ranking Chinese officials on UAE soil. Wu was released after an international outcry. But the fate of others is still unknown. Nagara Yusuf is also a Uyghur. So is her husband, Hussein. In 2017, he was detained in Dubai. Sky News asked the UAE, Turkey and Interpol for a response to our reporting, but received no reply. We also asked the Chinese government directly for a response to our reporting. They gave us no information about Nagare's husband. He has disappeared into a world of shadows, a world where China will continue to operate. Tom Cheshire, Sky News, Beijing. Now, how do you sleep at night? It's probably nothing.
like this. Here we go. This clip has been circulating on social media and shows Cheetah cuddling up to a man at a breeding centre in South Africa. Now, I think I'm right in saying that Cheetah don't have retractable claws. In fact, you can see their claws there, can't you? Um, yep, they're all snuggling in. <laughs> yeah, they could kill him like that if they wanted to, but obviously they are very, very as, as indeed, very comfortable. Dolph Volker, who films and studies the behaviour of Cheetah, that's him, he says, it's natural for the animals who are born and bred in captivity to share warmth. He didn't get much sleep, though, as you can imagine, uh, but it looks as though they did. Now, take a look at this rather beautiful photograph. Love it, love it, love it. Isn't that gorgeous? Image of two male lion in the rain among the runners-up in the People's Choice Award category of the Wildlife Photography of the Year competition. It's called Shelter from the Rain. Quite young guys, aren't they? Not much of a mane on there, even with the rain. Now, another favourite from the category, a surprise encounter between a bear and an eagle. <laughs> yeah, I know who my money's on. And this was the one that took home the title, Willows Reflected in a Frozen North Italian Lake, appropriately titled Lake of Ice. How is that? Absolutely stunning. Taken by the Italian photographer Cristiano Vendramin, who joins us now. Hello to you, Cristiano. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. What a spectacular photograph. Tell us the story behind it. Good morning. And, uh... First of all, let me say that uh, I'm very uh, grateful <clears throat> and uh, so excited for uh, your invitation uh, today. Um, I, I, I can't believe I, I won this award. It's a great uh, success for me. Um, Lake of Ice uh, represents for me the, the closure of a path uh, of growth. Uh, I always dream of being able to honor the, the beauty of the lake with uh, photography of uh, good artistic level. And uh, uh, I would like to, to dedicate my, 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 my picture to uh, a friend, Bruno De Lorenzo, who unfortunately passed away in 2018. And uh, he always pointed out the photographic potential of uh, Santa Croce Harley. It was a very good friend for me. And, uh, he always support me and encourage me to to my photography to improve to improve into my photographic path. So yeah. it's a special dedication about, for him, and I think uh, he helped me to win. Uh, he did. It's an absolutely sensational photograph. We'll just have another quick look at it and sharing it. Thank you so much for sharing it with my viewers right around the world this morning. We very much appreciate it. Thank you so much I for thank, joining us on I the program. Thank you, Stunning. Sure. Stunning. Thank day. you so much. Now, new highway code rules were brought in last week to make roads safer for cyclists, but it's unclear whether they have had the desired effect with reports of a growing number of clashes between drivers and cyclists. So we thought that we would put it to the test. Howard Cox, founder of Fair Fuel UK campaign, and Ian Comer, member of the Surrey Cycling Club, are both with us this morning. Ian, to you, first of all, um, has it made the roads safer? Um, I think any changes to the law that tries to make the road safer does. But today, you know, you have to look at it. And um, I think at the present moment, no, it's not. Because the reason being is lots of drivers don't know the new rules and think cyclists are just an uh, obstruction to them in the road. Howard, what do you think? Well, Ian's very right that we should be the highway code. Any changes to the highway code is welcome. We want to do that. But this ladies highway code is a cyclist charter to drive any how they wish, no matter how dangerous, without fear of any prosecution. I mean, they seem to have been given what appears to be a legal right to pass all the blame onto every other road user. And we're very worried about this. I mean, the only winners would be lawyers, insurance companies and undertakers. And let's be clear, I, on behalf of Fairfield UK and 1.7 million drivers, really do want safer roads for all road users. But this particular highway code, we think is dangerous. And I'm backed by the Road Haulage Association. And they really are worried about uh, the safety of cyclists because of the changes in the highway code. Ian? Yeah, um, I, I think one of the points is many, many cyclists are road users and drivers. So we understand what you should be looking out for. We also have you know, the ability to um, you know, focus very carefully on a cyclist. I think you know, some of the rules in place are really good. Um, you know, examples of being able to move into the middle of the road um, to prevent cars overtaking you in certain circumstances where they can't see round a bend. 
That is a classic. Um, happened to me this weekend. I'm riding out this weekend. A car overtook us on the wrong side of the road going around a bend he had no view of seeing. Now, not all car drivers are like that. And I understand, you know, not all cyclists are, are going to really be, um, you know, abiding by all the rules. But I think everybody has to take note, sit back, listen, read and understand. And one of the issues has been the publicity around this in the fact that yeah, it's been introduced, but there has been sort of uh, a lack of public awareness of uh, the new rules and regulations. And Howard? I could... Yes, I couldn't agree more with you, Ian. I think you're absolutely right. I, mean, I think every household should have been sent a copy of the Highway Code. But the, the issue is there's two or three uh, rules changes. One is allowing undertaking and overtaking by cyclists from behind, say, a 40-tonne truck, which does have blind spots. It can't help but have it. And we all look out, all responsible drivers and responsible cyclists do drive and cycle carefully, but we can't cater for them. Unfortunately, you do have a bunch of militant cyclists uh, that actually, unfortunately, would do, they, they're really relishing the new changes and taking advantage of the fact that they can control the roads now. And even when there are cycle lanes now on roads, they don't have to use them, it says on, on, in the new highway code. And that, that we just don't get this. We want safer roads. And Ian, and I, I would love to work closer with you to actually convince the government uh, uh, that we should be uh, working together on, on road user safety. Surely, um, Ian, if there's a cycle lane, that's what cyclists should be using. If it's suitable, yes, uh, they're not always suitable. Um, and it depends on the well, cycle. Yeah, we've got to understand these rules are for all cyclists. You're talking to a member of Surrey Cycling Club. Um, yeah, but rules are there for people who cycle to work, whose business is cycling. You know, you look at the number of um, delivery drivers now who use bikes. So it is uh, the, you know, the, the, the choice of the cyclist whether to use a cycle lane or in the road. There's no rules to say I can't cycle in a road, uh, even though there may be a cycle lane there. Yeah, but why, why wouldn't... I don't understand why you wouldn't use the cycle lane. That's what it's there for. It just depends on the conditions of the cycle lane. Um, you know, you have, to, you have to take that into consideration where the cycle lane is. If I have to cross the road to go onto a cycle lane and then cross the road again, surely me crossing the road twice... Uh, is potentially more dangerous than just staying on the on the road that I'm cycling on. Not all cycle lanes are running beside the road. Not all cycle lanes are on both sides of the road. Um, you know, and uh, this would be one one of the, the you know the main issues is that uh, you know it's the choice of where these cycle lanes are put. Um, is it suitable for a cyclist to you know dismount, cross the road, okay. go off the other side, and get onto another cycle lane? OK, good to talk to both of you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Hopefully we've put you together and then you can maybe discuss going forward um, how to help uh, both sides. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I think they said thanks. Uh, let's have a quick look at these uh, pictures, uh, should we, here. Um, on the programme this morning, here we go. How beautiful is that? It didn't win. But it was another one of those uh, wildlife pictures that we were uh, talking about in the competition. I think it, this is one of the ones where the lake one, you know, with the, with the trees in it. Just been speaking to the photographer who took that image. And uh, have we got another one? Not sure I understand that. I think it's what you call art. And finally... Yeah, I've got that one. Yeah, who are you looking at? How cute is that? Coming up in the next hour here on the programme, we're going to be uh, reminding you what the Health Minister has told me this morning. He's been talking about words having consequences when it comes to what the uh, Prime Minister said about Sakia Starmer and the Savile Slur. What does Labour think of it all? Stay tuned for more here on Sky. <laughs>